26 or until um, renewable uh, plants for self-consumption reach uh, the equivalent of 8% of the total installed capacity in all countries. Renewable uh, self-consumed electricity should be completely exempted from any taxes, fees or, or levies unless the excess generation, the excess electricity that is injected into the grid receives an incentive scheme, receives, a, for instance, a feed-in tariff. Um, the directive um, opens up, as mentioned before, new ways for uh, consumers to join forces and uh, act jointly. This is the so-called collective self-consumption. Self um, the um, the um, um, uh, conditions applicable to individual self-consumption and so-called collective self-consumption can be different, can be um, 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 uh, varied. However, um, there has to be a certain um, proportionality and, uh, and uh, justification when member states apply different conditions to collective self-consumers uh, as opposed to individual self-consumers. Um, finally, uh, it's, it's worth mentioning that the directive opens up new ways for um, innovative business models. It particularly mentions that um, renewable electricity for, for, for self-consumption, uh, for self-consumers, should, um, should be able to be um, traded in peer-to-peer in -peer arrangements as well as with uh, power purchase agreements and other innovative um, schemes like these ones. Moreover, um, it should be possible in Europe to introduce third-party ownership or management models where this is not possible yet. We think uh, in AIE as well as in Solar Power Europe that this directive is extremely important. It will be uh, important to, to open up new uh, business models, to create new jobs in Europe in the installation, operation and maintenance sector, and, and uh, it will, thanks to these self-consumption provisions that are the focus of today's webinar, um, allow all consumers in Europe to embrace the energy transition, including those that live or work in multi-occupancy buildings, or those who live and work in buildings whose roof is not suitable for PV on, 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 on the roof. So having said this, I'll give the floor to Aurélie from Solar Power Europe, or really the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Georgia, and hello, everyone. So a lot has been said already. I think the, the one of the most important thing about collective self-consumption is what also Georgia highlighted at the end of her uh, speech, which is the opportunity it opens for uh, renewable self-consumption to reach a far uh, better number of people to actually make the energy transition uh, a consumer-powered energy transition and ensure that the future frameworks for self-consumption will be inclusive. And, and this is why also politically uh, thinking about collective self-consumption is a, a very strong imperative. Um, solar Power Europe is the European Association uh, for the solar sector. We represent over uh, 200 companies which are active across the whole solar value chain in Europe. And indeed, uh, with AIE, I believe uh, we have been able to, to, to work together extremely well in order to obtain in this final framework all the nice progresses and provisions that Georgia just mentioned. And it is true that today with this Renewable Energy Directive, uh, we have high hopes that we will be able to develop innovative business models for collective self-consumption. But for this, we also need to acknowledge that the, the work we have to do collectively is not over. So now that the clean energy package has been finally adopted, uh, member states still have to develop an enabling framework for collective self-consumption and uh, develop this framework within their national energy and climate plans, which should be finalized by the 31st of December 2019. And once this framework uh, has been defined, it has to be transposed into national legislation at the latest by the 30th of June 2021. So the question now, uh, which is key, is the how. Um, because 
We have various frameworks which are already existing in several countries all over Europe. Uh, there are already good practices, a lot of good examples that we can learn from and also some cases to reflect on when it comes to not repeating the mistakes that could have been done in the past in a certain uh, member state. And this is why indeed uh, Solar Power Europe and AIE came out with this idea on the webinar series um, in order to provide you and us actually with a deep dive on the various regulatory frameworks in place um, and in order to learn from this collectively. Uh, so, before I introduce uh, the first uh, the, the panelist for this first session, so we will be looking at Germany, uh, France and, and Greece, I would like to uh, just uh, do some housekeeping for the attendees here on the webinar. We want to work with you today. Um, we are uh, looking forward to listening to the, the presentations of our participants, but we are also looking forward to listen to your own insights and questions. So you have here on the slide uh, the, the to-dos if you would like to interact with us uh, and send a question to the presenter. We will make our utmost to be sure that all the questions that are being asked uh, can be addressed during this webinar series. So, I will now have the pleasure to introduce our three uh, presenters for this webinar series. David Crean, which is political advisor at the German Solar Association, BSW. David Stickelberger, which is director at the Swiss uh, Solar Association. And Stelios Psomas, which is policy advisor at the Greek Solar Association, ELAPCO. I hope I did not uh, mispronounce any one of your um, any of your names, gentlemen. And I would like now to give the floor to David Crean from the BSW. Thank you all for for being here today. So thank you, Aurélie, and also thank you, Georgia, for the proper introduction. Also thank you to AIE and Solar Power Europe for hosting this very interesting webinar. So um, let me give you some um, insights into the German um, scheme, support scheme for collective self-consumption in, in the next few slides. At first, uh, I want to give you uh, some a brief um, overview of what the BSW is doing. We are a lobbying um, organization here in Germany based in Berlin, and we are taking care about the political and relations, public relations, market observation as well, and trying since more than 30 years already to improve the regulatory framework for solar, um, electric, solar PV, also uh, solar thermal um, applications um, here in Germany. So let me at first um, give you some basic distinction um, of different uh, collective um, self-consumption support schemes here in Germany. Um, one has to differentiate between the Mieterstrom law according to the e Erneuerbare Energiengesetz, um, which was um, introduced in, in July 2017, and other models of collective self-consumption which are not particularly um, supported, but however are possible to um, to be um, conducted. Um, like uh, for the Mieterstrom um, law, um, there are certain criteria in order to be eligible. Um, each um, kilowatt hour which is produced by PV and consumed locally is rewarded with a premium payment. Um, which is um, deduced um, from the um, overall um, feed-in tariff level um, written down in the EEG. I will um, step on to, to this uh, Mieterstrom law on the following slides, um, but um, now I want to give some information about um, the other models um, of collective self-consumption here in Germany, um, which are also possible, which don't have a, a, a framework, but however, um, are co quite common. Um, we see it also, it's also possible for uh, commercial um, tenants to uh, to participate in collective self-consumption schemes. Um, and there are also some benefits. Um, the, the participants of these schemes, of these models um, can have. Um, like for example, 
um, the reduction of the electricity tax um, and also um, um, feed-in tariffs or um, feed-in premiums um, are, are given for the um, excess electricity uh, which is fed into the grid. Um, however, at this point, uh, one also have to remark that uh, the, the, um, that it's not eligible for industrial um, consumers, as um, plants which are higher than or uh, like above 750 kilowatt peaks um, do have to participate in tenders here in Germany and are not allowed to um, to market or directly market their um, electricity to certain customers. Now coming back to the Mieterstrom law um, within the Renewable Energy Act, EEG, and there are some, well, at least quite a lot, um, criteria um, which are um, which have to be fulfilled in order to be eligible for the premium payments. And that one criteria is that the PV system size must not exceed 100 kilowatt peak. Also, there are some criteria for the buildings. There has to be a, at least 40% um, of living or residential um, houses. So um, it can be mixed houses on, with commercial customers and residential flats, but however, 40% have to be at least for, for living. Another criteria um, is the usage of the grid. The PV electricity has to be delivered without the usage, usage of the public grid. So all the electricity has to be consumed within the building or at least the surrounding annexes. And also there are some criteria regarding the self-consumer. So the self-consumer has to be an end customer. There has to be only one contractor for all the electricity supplies, like for the electricity from the PV plant, as well as from the um, the rest of the electricity supplies um, from the public grid. So there has to be one contractor only. Yeah, I've just mentioned that um, inside the, the electricity has to be consumed within the building or nearby. And another criteria which has to be met is that the, the PV electri electricity has to be built separately from each participating con consumer, which um, um, which is quite difficult to be to be met um, in these projects. On this slide, I have um, I've showed the, the two different models which are possible under the German uh, Mittelstrom Gesetz. Um, like there's two different two different um, ways of supplying or, or contracting with the tenants. First of all, it could be a landlord um, um, who is who is having a leasing contract with a service provider, and the service provider is signing a, the Mieterstrom contract with the tenant. So, another model could be a landlord, the owner of the building which have, has different service contracts with the utility, with the EPC or installers on the one hand and has on the other hand um, his Mieterstrom contract with um, the tenant. Another boundary which has to be met within the Mieterstrom contract is that the price for the delivered electricity or the PV electricity is kept at 90% of the basic tariff corresponding to the, to the area. Um, yes, so these two models are quite common. However, um, one remark for the for the first model, the service provider, like the, the EEG clearly tells that this is possible, but still we in Germany we have some discussion about about this. So what are the experiences of the of this law here put in place since um, um, July 2017. Unfortunately, the, the market development has been rather slow. So up until end of March 2019, there was about 12 megawatts of total installed capacity, which is rather low. We, we, we think, we believe, too much too low. Um, so it appears that the amount of the benefit, the amount of the premium payments 
do not cover the costs for implementing these meter strom models in, a, in an economic viable way. Also other restriction might be a barrier as a, like, like the criteria, the three conditions I, I showed on the slide before. And the German government at the moment is still waiting. They have an evalu evaluation on the law going on. And until then, they they won't. They say they won't change anything. Um, but it's due to be published this the evaluation in end of September. So I think then we we hope or we think that then it became it will become quite clear that some improvements have to be done on this uh, on this framework. We have some. For proposals uh, for for this fr for improving the framework. So at first, one could um, the government could increase the premium payments, of course. It could also increase the size of eligible systems um, up to at least 250 kilowatt peaks in order to make uh, also like um, supplies within certain areas possible. They should also reduce the requirements for metering and billing and could also remove the capped electricity price um, like we have on all other contracts parties should be free to agree upon price levels themselves um, they should also increase the the scope of of spatial area of range in order to remove uh, the barriers to for the supply of neighboring buildings and they should make clear that also fully um, commercially used buildings should be eligible for, for this um, framework, for this support scheme. Also, um, more broad, we, we, we hope or we push the, the German government to improve the, the framework for um, local self-consumption and presuming um, here in, in Germany, um, we, we have proposed uh, some major improvements in the framework for local self-consumption by, uh, for example, fully removing non-energy related surcharges, include, including payments like, for example, for the EEG umlage. Um, the government should also treat um, the in individual and the collective self-consumption equally they should enable a non-discriminatory framework for, for trading, for peer-to-peer -peer trading, and also um, push forward with a um, new, new framework for storage systems and flexibility options. This is also um, something we will have to work on in the, in the light of the revised Renewable Energy Directive, as uh, Georgia already introduced. So thank you for your attention and I'm um, looking forward to your questions. Thank you, David. Uh, here is uh, Naomi Chevia from Solar Power Europe and taking over for the, for the Q&A session. Um, so I have a first question uh, from the audience. Is the premium awarded to self-consumed PV production higher than the value awarded via feed-in tariff? um it's it's the the fee, they get the the feed in tariff and an additional premium so it's higher yes okay. <laughs> and the the premium tariff um, like the the premium the the Mieterstrom zuschlag the premium is about the, the amount the, the reduction of the the eeg the 40 percent reduction of the eeg umlage so it's about three three to four to four cents per kilowatt hour Okay. Okay. Um, another question. Um, so your your comment on the fact that the gov the German government tried to um, block virtual net metering uh, during renewable the discussion on the renewable energy directive. Um, so your, your comment on, on this and uh, what are your expectations regarding uh, the, the, the reassessment of the collective self-consumption scheme in uh, coming in September? Um, yes, like for the virtual net metering, 
Um, our view on this is that net metering might not be the the best solution for um, introducing or for like for for supporting um, smart and and technology driven um, decentralized um, self consumption um, applications. So um, I don't know what what was the reason why the German government did so, but from from our point of view. We, we were fine with this, <laughs> um, and from the from the revision of the Mittelstrom law in fall in this fall, um, we, we clearly hope that they change the, the the regulation in order to to make them to make the models the um, the support schemes more attractive. Okay, thank you. Um, and maybe maybe another uh, another question um, in terms of uh, from from my side. Um, in terms of metering, is there any is there any uh, preconditions in terms of uh, metering? And is there a pos all the all the tenants uh, have the possibility to contract with another a different supplier for the residual um, part of their electricity? Uh, is that is that right? Um, within the Mieterstrom law, it's not possible for the tenants to contract with another supplier. They have to have the the one the one Mieterstrom supplier, who is including okay. the PV electricity as well as the residual electricity. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, and maybe you know, two two other questions arrive. So. Um, why did Germany choose to make mandatory one supplier for the whole participants? So, I'd like this, I, I guess this question referred to the to the Mitterstrom supplier. Why why this uh, why is there this this scheme? Yeah, it's like Germany is taking care of of the protection of the rights of the tenants, and they wanted to yeah to make it simple for the tenant to. Um, yeah, to 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 evaluate the the um, um, yes the offer of the Mitterstrom supplier. So that's I think the main reason why they they also have the 90% uh, cap of the price and just what there should be one supplier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh... Well, there is a last question about the virtual net metering. What, what's the technical argument to block virtual net metering? I guess you partly answered it. Uh, you, you partly answered to the to this question. But yeah, it's it's like if you do do um, virtual net metering, all the electricity is fed into the grid, so the the grid operator will will have to deal with it. So I think that's one thing, which is difficult in in in, real, in 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 this country or like in the electricity supplies you will also don't need um, or you don't have storage systems anymore and um, like re regarding the unbundling um, um, European unbundling it's it might become difficult for grid operators to to operate um, storage systems so mm -hmm. that's maybe one that's a big discussion and um, yes, but but we're not convinced that is a, a proper solution for for the de decentralized uh, systems yet. <laughs> Georgia here, I guess that uh, Thelios uh, Somas from the Greek Association um, will maybe uh, come back to this point as uh, as you will hear in a moment. Uh, Greece has a virtual net metering scheme in place, and the Greek Association. Um, is quite happy and supportive of it. So let's uh, maybe wait uh, for uh, Stelios to, to take the floor in, a, in some minutes and uh, comment on this uh, scheme. Okay. Yes, indeed. So uh, yeah, there are many questions, but we will uh, we will move on now. Um, so thank you a lot again, uh, David, for uh, for for sharing with us uh, your your knowledge about the Mitterstrom scheme in Germany. Um, we'll move now to uh, Switzerland. So um, if we can have next slide. Yes. So uh, I have the pleasure to give the give the floor to uh, David Stickelberger, who is Managing Director of the Solar, uh, the Swiss Solar Association, uh, Swiss Solar. 
Yes, um, hello everybody. Thank you for giving me the op opportunity to um, show you something about the Swiss self-consumption model. Um, although we are not a member of the European Union, so we have a separate directive. Um, where's my mouse? This is my mouse, sorry. Uh, go back again. Just a few words about uh, Swiss solar, which is um, quite similar to uh, BSW you have seen before. We have around 700 members all around the, the value chain of solar energy, also PV and solar thermal. We do lobbying. Um, we have a label. We do uh, education for our members uh, and so on. Um, I would like to give you a brief introduction into the, the energy strategy 2050. This is the legal base for us, uh, and the, the people have voted about it uh, two years ago. Um, um, and basically, it, we decided to, to phase out nuclear power without fixing a date for, um, for stopping the existing uh, power stations. Um, there is a, a levy on electricity consumption to finance programs for the support of sustainable uh, and uh, renewable clean power generation. We have um, phased out the, the feed-in tariff we had before. Now we have only a one-off payment, which covers around 25% of the investment costs of a PV plant. We have introduced new rules for self-consumption, We I will show later on. And there was also a goal uh, which was fixed, which is 11.4 uh, toward hours of um, new renewable energy, which is half of what nuclear power produces today. Um, Please note only uh, also that we do not have a fully liberalized electricity market. The liberalization is only for consumers with more than 100 megawatt hours per year. There is um, a full uh, liberalization planned, but there is a strong resi resistance against it from utilities and also from trade unions. This uh, causes quite a lot of uncertainty also uh, for, for the self-consumption schemes I will show you later on because nobody knows exactly how it will proceed. Um, I would say we will not have it uh, in the next few years, five years. It will depend on uh, the bilateral electricity agreement we want to have with the European Union, but this is part of a big um, a big project with many other um, agreements with the European Union, which are uh, a lot discussed, and um, this, this will take a lot of time before it will uh, will be agreed upon. So that's the uncertainty. Um, there is quite a long story of self-consumption in Switzerland, but basically uh, it, it was done informally before 2014, but only in 2014 it was legally fixed and per uh, 1st uh, January 2018, there was this um, uh, collective self-consumption scheme I will show you now. There were first amendments on 1st of April of this year on this uh, decree. You see two models. It's a bit similar to, to Germany. There is a, like, a, a, we call it utility model, and there is the we call it in German ZEF, uh, Zusammenschluss zum Eigenverbrauch, or self-consumption consortium could be translated in, in English, uh, which is what I will go uh, more uh, into the details later on. But first, a little bit about this utility models model. What does it mean? Basically, a utility can make a contract with the house owner uh, with his PV plant and um, buy his electricity, solar electricity, and sell it to his tenants and do all the, the, uh, the calculation and so on, so that the, the house owner doesn't have anything to do with it. In this case, the tenant remains a, um, a client of the local utility. As you remember, uh, the, the normal tenant is a client of the local utility, cannot change it because there is no liber liberalized market. The other model is more interesting. Um, it is possible for one or several buildings, for one or several building owners, it can be rented or owner occupied homes, everything is possible. Um, this is um, the, these are the conditions that uh, have to be kept in mind. The involved properties must be adjacent to each other, but as from 
uh, 1st of April of this year, it's possible to cross uh, rivers or roads or railway lines between the two parcels uh, which, which would want to, to have this uh, community together. So in this case, you have maybe a farmhouse and the other houses which use the electricity on the other side of the, of the road. Um, there must be only one grid connection point. You see it here. And the use of the public grid is not allowed, which is a problem, of course. And the, uh, the only restriction uh, is that the PV nominal power must be at least 10% of the nominal power of the connection point to the public grid. So you cannot put a, a very small PV plant on, on your roof and, and make a, um, a SCC. There are protection rules for tenants, like in, in Germany, um, for rented dwellings, uh, it looks like this. Uh, the, the price of the kilowatt hour delivered to the member of the SCC must not be higher than the cost of uh, the kilowatt hour that the tenant would pay without the SCC. So you see it uh, on this scheme here. This is the price the tenant would have to pay without the uh, SCC, which is in this case 20 Swiss cents per kilowatt hour. This is the average price in Switzerland for a um, household. Um, the electricity from uh, the, the solar plant costs 16 cents and um, there is a, a limitation on the return on investment, which is at 2%. So it is 16 cents per kilowatt hour, but the difference between the 16 and the 20 may be shared with, uh, uh, between the house owner and the tenant. So the tenant in this case would have to pay 18 Swiss cents per kilowatt hour for electricity from uh, the solar plant. Okay. Um, Oh, one more thing I would like to mention about the tenants. Um, a tenant may not leave the SCC um, once he has agreed upon being part of it, except if the house owner is not able to deliver electricity anymore. But otherwise, he, he remains a member of the uh, SCC. And then, of course, if we have a full liberalization, everybody asks uh, himself what will happen then, because then the, the, the law will probably have to be changed. So that's the, the uncertainty. What is the motivation to go for self-consumption? Um, the consumer prices are, for in households are typically above 20 euro cents uh, per kilowatt hour. The, um, if you have to deliver the solar uh, electricity back, uh, back to the, the grid, it's a low price. It's somewhere around seven euro cents per kilowatt hour. Um, life cycle cost of electricity, uh, PV electricity is somewhere lower than 15 euro cents. Um, so it helps to reduce the uh, amount of electricity uh, to the grid if you have an SCC and you can increase uh, self consumption. and one more thing, if you have maybe um, 30 apartments in your multifamily house, uh, you have a consumption of more than 100 megawatt hours per year. And, and this way you get a, a direct access to the uh, liberalized electricity market. So you get the, the external electricity will be cheaper than before. What are the experiences uh, and difficulties so far? Uh, we, we see a significant market share. As I have just asked around a little bit and we have somewhere around 400 projects so far on, uh, only in a bit more than one year. Um, 20 megawatts, which is, I would say, something like 15% of, of the, the market volume in Switzerland. And other 300 projects seem to be planned, so it's quite a substantial part of the market. However, there are some barriers uh, which should be uh, improved. We have made proposals proposal for that. The very low limit for the return on investment, the 2%, you remember it, uh, stops many investors. That's a difficulty, but that will be very difficult to be overcome because it's part of the tenants protection legislation. And the other problem is that uh, the transformation of an existing distribution grid to become part of the SEC is very difficult. I will show you a few, few examples. In this case, you have here the streets, you have uh, several houses, all of them connected to the public grid. 
um, they want to make an SCC, uh, they would have to make a new line between the houses, which is obviously too expensive, they, they stop the project. In the next case, it's completely different. These th three houses want to, to connect them themselves. They can transfer this public line to a, a house installation if the utility is willing to do that, to sell it, and then uh, it's feasible to, to make an SCC in this case. So this is my last slide. I want just to, to show you a few uh, fine examples of uh, SCCs. Uh, all of these are on, on new um, apartments, but we have also some ex examples in existing ones. Uh, very big uh, new neighborhoods with 60 flats, uh, 160 kilowatt PV, 120 flats, uh, 200 flats, uh, 36 flats. So you see uh, something is going on. Uh, many of, the, of these new uh, uh, neighborhoods uh, use um, the cell collective self consumption. So uh, that's my first, uh, last slide. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, David. Th thank you a lot for your presentation. Um, so again, we'll, uh, we have some time to get some questions from the audience. Um, a first question, um, is collective self-consumption in Switzerland only valid for solar as renewable energy sources or is it open to other renewable energy sources? It's open to uh, other renewable energy sources. There is one project where hydroelectricity and PV is combined. Okay. But it's uh, it's not the majority of projects. No, no, no. The the, the huge majority is PV because uh, what else should it be? Well, it, it has to it has to be uh, renewable electricity, of course. Okay. And uh, another question: um, What is the average payback uh, term for a residential investment? If you have an idea. Uh, I would say the average is somewhere between 10 and, and 15 years. Mm -hmm. Okay, 10 and 15 years. Okay. Um, and uh, so, so you mentioned that there was uh, an update recently of the law and do you see uh, the scheme evolving in, in the future, um, in the future uh, month or year? Um, the, the, the two amendments which were, were made were, was uh, the pricing of PV electricity. That was a huge advantage and the, the possibility of crossing uh, roads and, and rivers. Uh, but the, the next thing we would have to overcome is the use of the public grid. But and that will be very difficult because it, it would be contradictory to the, the, the non-liberalized electricity market. Imagine having a, an open... Um, level seven uh, electricity grid for uh, collective self-consumption in, in a non-liberalized market, it, it doesn't really fit together. So that, that will be very difficult. But yeah. I guess it will evolve by, by, by making a virtual uh, net metering. And there is a very interesting um, uh, project. If you are interested, you can uh, look it up in the, in the, on, the, on the website. It's only in German, unfortunately. It's called Quartier slash, uh, uh, no, um, how do you say, um, Quartier um, minus Quartierstrom.ch. And this is a, this is a blockchain project in a, in a, a small town in Switzerland where mm -hmm. uh, 37 uh, households are connected together uh, with, a, with a virtual uh, net metering um, scheme um, or it's a virtual collective sales consumption mm -hmm. and actually it's it's not really compatible with with the existing law but everybody likes it and it's a pilot project that's why they do it okay so uh, other innovation maybe maybe we can send it to uh, information about this pilot project to participants uh, and to answer uh, also to a couple of questions yes we will share the the presentations after the the webinar to all participants Okay, it's also in English, I see, by the way. It's, there's an English version of this website. I will send you the link. Okay. Okay, so uh, thanks a lot, David, for, for this presentation. Uh, as time is uh, running, um, I think we will move to the last uh, presentation of the um, 
virtual net metering in Greece. Um, so uh, I will now give the floor to Stelos uh, Psomas, who works for the Greek Solar Association. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'll try to be as quick as possible because time is running, but my slides are not running at the moment. Okay. Uh, Greece has a history of uh, regulations and legislation regarding uh, net metering. Uh, the first legislation was introduced uh, back in 2013, but it took us a few years before that was actually applied in practice. Three years later, we introduced uh, the so-called virtual net metering scheme, uh, which is the central part of my presentation. Uh, two years later, we introduced uh, a scheme based on energy communities, and I will uh, later explain what we mean by energy communities. And only this year, we tried to make a combination uh, between energy communities and the virtual net metering scheme in order to um, have what we call collective net metering in Greece, which is the key point of my presentation. Next, please. Okay. Uh, just to give you some basics on uh, these schemes, um, trying to explain what net metering means in Greece. Uh, the, this uh, term has been used, uh, especially in the US, with a different term. Uh, the Greek net metering scheme is not similar to the US scheme. Uh, that means we don't offset uh, retail prices, but we only offset a certain portion of uh, electricity prices, which makes it completely different. How it works, the excess energy from a PV installed at the premises of the consumer is injected into the grid and uh, I mean the excess energy, that is the, the energy which is not self-consumed instantly. And this excess energy can be used at a later time to offset consumption uh, during the times that PV energy is not available. Uh, it is like using the grid as a huge battery, let's say, and you have the right to, to do so for a netting period of three years. Uh, after these three years, uh, you have uh, a netting and any excess energy that has been injected into the grid and has not been netted uh, during this period is not uh, remunerated. Uh, you sign a contract uh, with uh, your power provider for 25 years. And um, when it comes to the residential sector, the, there is an upper limit for the systems that can be installed, which is 20 kilowatt peak. While for uh, uh, commercial and industrial systems, uh, the upper limit uh, has been recently raised to one megawatt peak. Uh, peak. Also, there are some lower uh, limits for the islands with autonomous grids, which is a detail I don't want to go into that at the moment. Uh, very recently, we uh, introduced a scheme, the sa very same uh, scheme with uh, storage, which actually, uh, what, what does storage uh, do? Uh, it increases the self-consumption rate of the produced PV energy. That means in practice that uh, the uh, prosumer has a, a higher uh, benefit by uh, and an extra reduction to their bill. However, there is a, a currently a limit of 30 kilo uh, kVA in storage capacity, which we are not happy with. And again, the maximum PV system capacity is the same as in the normal uh, net metering scheme. The third scheme that was introduced is the virtual net metering one. Uh, which extends the net metering uh, idea from one to multiple consumption points. The energy produced by a PV plant is used to offset multiple energy bills, uh, which uh, they, they, may, they, they need to belong to one single person or entity. Uh, for example, imagine a person having uh, a main uh, flat and then uh, uh, another house in the country for the holidays so they, they can serve both houses using uh, 
their uh, uh, the, this uh, scheme, but uh, with the limitation that this person should be a, a professional farmer or a public entity. Uh, otherwise, uh, if uh, another person wants to make use of this virtual net metering scheme, they have to form an, a so-called energy community. And by energy community, we uh, mean a scheme which is uh, either related, uh, let's say, to the, the tenants of uh, an apartment uh, building, or uh, it can be something bigger, like uh, a consortium which decides to build uh, a, a PV power station and sell electricity to the grid. So uh, the energy community uh, idea is partly used uh, together with virtual net metering uh, to serve uh, collective schemes. Again, the, uh, the, the maximum uh, capacity for an energy community which uh, want to, wants to make uh, use of this uh, virtual net metering scheme is one megawatt peak. Uh, it is important to see how this uh, scheme works in the case of uh, the normal net metering case. Uh, scheme and then uh, what is the difference between the normal net metering uh, case and the virtual net metering? Uh, the, the, the bill that everyone receives, uh, the electricity bill, uh, has two different uh, uh, sections. The one is the so-called competitive charges, which is generally related, and the other is the regulated charges, which includes grid fees, uh, the source the ch charges uh, that consumers pay for the support of renewable energy, uh, some uh, social related fees and charges, etc., etc. In the case of the, the simple net metering case, uh, the uh, prosumer actually benefits uh, uh, fully from, uh, they, they, they save 100% of the energy related charges. Uh, in Greece, for example, uh, the average uh, retail price of electricity for a residential uh, consumer is uh, 17 euro cents per kilowatt hour, uh, while the energy related part of it is uh, nearly 9 cents. The rest is the regulated charges. When it comes to the grid fees, uh, the prosumer pays uh, for the percentage that they, uh, of time they use the grid. They only save the self-consumed uh, uh, part of, of energy produced by the PV system. For example, if the self-consumption rate uh, in a certain house is 35%, then the prosumer saves uh, the 100% of the competitive charges, they save 35% of the grid fees, they save 35% of some, some of the charges, and they pay uh, full uh, charges for the so-called fully imposed charges. Uh, that is, on average, uh, the uh, residential consumers save something uh, like 30% uh, in this example of the regulated uh, charges. That means that uh, an average uh, payback period for such a prosumer is, uh, in Greece is uh, uh, around 10 years. When it comes to virtual net metering, uh, again, we have the same uh, percentage for competitive charges. Uh, when it comes to grid fees, uh, the consumption point where the PV is installed uh, uh, is exactly the same with a normal vert, uh, net metering case. However, all the other consumption points that are served by this system, they have to pay 100% of grid fees as normal consumers. This is also true for all other charges. As you realize, the benefit for the consumption points uh, that are uh, making use of this collective system obviously is uh, lower than the normal uh, net metering case. Now, uh, energy communities uh, have a, a priority when they apply for a grid connection offer because it takes a lot of time to uh, be served when you actually apply for a, a net metering uh, PV system. And when it comes to bigger systems where you need an environmental permit or uh, you have to authorize your system, uh, community energy communities are exempted from this uh, uh, tax of certain taxes and they are faster uh, in authorization procedures. 
there is a discussion uh, promised by the Ministry of Energy uh, that energy communities uh, will receive uh, grants up to 60 percent but uh, there is not any uh, concrete proposal as yet. They say that there is an amount of 25 million for this purpose, uh, but we don't know how it will, uh, it will work in practice. Uh, as I said before, the contracts for all the schemes, uh, both the normal net metering and the virtual uh, net metering scheme is for 25 years with a power provider. Uh, in the case of virtual net metering, you actually declare which consumption points are included in the scheme. In the case of energy communities, uh, you also declare the desired consumption points. And apart from the consumption points related to the members of an energy community, these communities have the right to, to declare consumption points uh, of poor and unprivileged uh, families so that they can also benefit from the virtual net metering scheme. Uh, the energy community has also the right to change these declared consumption points if, for example, a member leaves the community by simply declaring a new list of consumption points to their power provider. Uh, all these schemes, as I said, we started in uh, 2013. Unfortunately, there is a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of, de of delays. Uh, so uh, the record is rather poor. Uh, since the beginning of the virtual net metering scheme, we only had uh, 177 applications and only 15 of them were actually connected uh, to the grid as of April uh, this year. Uh, obviously, we're not happy with these figures. And uh, just because we had a lot of delays and a lot of changes in the regulations, we have no actual example yet of energy communities for collecting uh, cell consumptions. And uh, I guess uh, we'll need some more um, amendments in the legislation before the scheme works uh, better. Uh, now, let me give you very briefly two examples of how the scheme uh, works. In the first example, uh, suppose you have some families that form an energy community and install a PV system at a nearby field in order to cover their needs. In this case, the virtual net metering scheme would apply. And uh, that means that uh, since the, the point of the PV, uh, the PV installation is not a consumption point, uh, these families only have the benefit of the energy part of their bill. So they save something like eight to nine euros cents per kilowatt hour produced by their PV system. Uh, if uh, this, in the second example, uh, if, if we suppose that the PV system is installed on the building roof, uh, and um, the PV system is directly connected to a, met a meter serving one of the apartments, this specific uh, connection point will uh, benefit both from the competitive charges plus a part of the regulated charges. That is, in our example, it will save something like 11 to 12 euro cents per kilowatt hour, while the rest of the tenants will only save 8 to 9 uh, euro cents per kilowatt uh, produced by the PV system. So there seems to be a, a problem here, a paradox, because if these families uh, uh, had chosen to proceed with the normal net metering scheme, they would uh, benefit more and uh, they, could, they would have a, high, uh, a much better uh, uh, return on en their investment. So I, our proposal in this case is that uh, the tenants uh, who want to uh, make use of a collective uh, scheme uh, in, in this case, a regulated charges for every consumption point should be similar to the ones applied in the normal net metering scheme. And also the building should be considered as a, a de facto energy community uh, without the need to be registered as such, uh, thus avoiding unnecessary bureaucracy and costs. Uh, since there was uh, a discussion before about uh, whether the virtual net metering scheme uh, is uh, really makes sense. Uh, I must say that uh, we as an association consider this scheme as an interim one before we pass to what will be valid uh, all over Europe uh, according to the new directive. That is, uh, we see that in the future we'll have a, a real-time self-consumption scheme and uh, remuneration of uh, the excess energy that is fed into the grid 
we also believe that uh, introducing storage systems and blockchain uh, schemes uh, in the coming years uh, will also need uh, bring, bring uh, changes uh, in legislation. However, for the time being, we think that the virtual net metering scheme is um, um, needed in certain cases. I can give you some examples. For example, uh, assume that you have a municipality uh, which need, wants to serve uh, some of their buildings like schools, health centers, uh, libraries, etc., with a PV system. Only the schools normally have uh, enough room to, to, put, to install a, a large PV system. And at the same time, schools are closed uh, during the summertime, so you cannot actually make the best use of your PV system with uh, real-time self-consumption. In that case, the virtual net metering scheme uh, really helps. And uh, a similar example uh, would be uh, used, for example, in, in uh, islands where you have a lot of uh, touristic uh, buildings and hotels. And again, it may not be possible for them to install uh, the appropriate PV systems in their uh, roofs because there's not enough space or because of the historic buildings. So they make use of virtual net metering by installing a, a ground mounted, let's say, system um, somewhere nearby outside uh, the community. So thank you for... Uh, for that and I'm open to questions. Thank you, Stelius. Thank you a lot for um, for your presentation and for the clarification and the perspective you, you gave us on, on, uh, on the future of net metering. Um, so again, we have some minutes for uh, for Q&A, um, a few questions here. So about the, um, the financial return um, of of for uh, no for the, the the business model of the collective uh, self consumption so our first question are the exemptions on taxes and reductions on regulated fees sufficient for having a business case for energy communities uh one of the things we demand from the ministry as i said before there are some charges that even the prosumers have to pay 100% uh, this is a, a charge of around two to three cents per kilowatt hour produced by your uh, PV system. Most of these uh, charges uh, are serving, uh, they're actually um, given as support to oil fired uh, electricity production in islands, and this is. Uh, um, a rather, uh, rather a paradox. For example, people. Uh, producing their own solar energy, they, they have to pay money to uh, oil fired power station. It doesn't make sense. That's why we said that this uh, kind of charges should be abolished, at least for the prosumers. That would uh, make uh, a big difference uh, when it comes to payback times. Uh, uh, in the worst case, uh, you can save uh, a year, let's say. You can uh, actually have a lower payback by one year. Um, uh, we we don't want to prosumers to to make use of the grid with no charges in the case they use the grid because we realize that in such a model such a model would create a lot of uh, uh, reactions especially by utilities we want to have a fair system i believe with the exception of these uh, uh, public service uh, charges that we have uh, the rest of the system is rather fair when it comes to balancing and offsetting money um, however, when it comes to the uh, collective scheme, the payback period is much uh, higher than the normal uh, net metering scheme, and I don't think this is uh, um, enough to make uh, people, uh, you know, uh, willing to, to proceed with uh, collective schemes. Uh, we need to do something more than we have now. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, Another uh, another question, uh, more practical. How can the netting period of three years uh, be checked? Uh, is it using guarantees of origin or or using? I mean, how, how uh, no, it? no. Uh, what, what happens is that uh, when you connect the system, uh, you have uh, two meters. One is the incoming meter, the usual consumer uh, meter. The other is the outcoming meter, which is uh, the meter that uh, 
counts uh, first how much energy was produced by the PV system and how much energy was actually injected to the grid and then uh, netted during this three years period. So uh, everything is very uh, clear. Uh, and when you receive your energy bill, all these parameters are written in detail. It says how much energy your system has produced, how much energy was injected to the grid, so uh, how much energy was actually netted. And every three years, uh, th this is done in every uh, energy bill you receive, either on a monthly basis or, or a quarterly basis, depending on the category you belong to. But uh, after this three years period, uh, the, the power uh, provider sends you uh, a balancing sheet which says what happened during these three years. And if there is any excess energy, this is lost for you. And if there is any difference in these netting amounts, then they either send you some amount uh, uh, in your uh, uh, bank bill, uh, account or they demand uh, you to pay the extra that was not uh, accounted for. Uh, this is done. Uh, I don't think this is a problem. Uh, maybe the three years period, uh, which we never actually demanded and asked, uh, is a large period. Initially, it was one year. I think it made more sense during the year because you have uh, an annual picture when it, it's it's more normal for you to to have uh, a bill on a yearly basis rather than a three years basis. But anyway, uh, this is not a problem when it comes to practical uh, uh, and things. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thank you. Um, so, um, another, another question maybe, uh, is there a potential for utilities to act as uh, energy service companies, pre-financing uh, community solar installation to energy communities? Uh, as you know, all energy providers have uh, some obligations to uh, offer uh, energy efficiency measures to their customers. Unfortunately, at least uh, until uh, the end of 2020, uh, PV is not an eligible technology. In theory, many energy providers, many power providers would like the idea of uh, us acting as an ESCO, especially with PV, because to be honest, uh, apart from lighting, which is easy, uh, most of other interventions like changing windows or even uh, changing, uh, uh, putting insulation in a building is a, is a thing which is not easy to do. While installing a PV system is something which is easy and uh, power providers are more familiar with. So uh, they would like to ask uh, to act as ESCOs, but unfortunately the regulations so far don't give them this right. I, I hope that uh, after a couple of years and uh, this right will be given to uh, power providers and we'll see uh, collective schemes and uh, power providers as, uh, acting as ESCOs and mm -hmm. actually financing initially the PV systems needed. Okay, thank you. Thank you a lot again for the answer. Um, let me check. Uh, the questions. Um, yes, uh, not a question, but a comment. Uh, we just arrived in Greece. The vast majority of the population, over 60%, resides in multi apartment buildings. Therefore, without a scheme, while virtual net metering, these people are practically excluded from being prosumers. Um, Another comment, I, I fully agree with this comment, and uh, we also need not to exclude the uh, office buildings or uh, companies, small companies that uh, also um, are installed in, in buildings. Um, maybe a last question. So in Greece, are you speaking about self-consumption as such or self-sufficiency? And if it is self-consumption, don't you have rebound effect at the prosumer level to reach 35%? Uh, um, I think this is referring to the slide that you show on the... Um... Oh, yeah, that, that was just an example of uh, a typical uh, um, residential uh, flat which, uh, with a self-consumption rate of 35%. Obviously, uh, uh, the self-consumption rate uh, depends on the prof demand profile of the consumer. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, if you have... Um, um, a family where uh, 
you know, bo 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 a couple of, bo with uh, two people both working, their uh, demand uh, profile will, uh, would uh, give a, a consumption rate, self-consumption rate of around 20%. Mm -hmm. Well, if you have people living uh, all day long uh, in the, the apartment, the consumption rate may be as high as 50%. So it really depends. Uh, that was just an example of an average uh, residential uh, prosumer. Okay, okay. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Stelios, again for uh, for sharing your knowledge on the Greek scheme. I think we'll have to close now the, the Q&A and the webinar um, because time uh, flew and we already used a, a little more time. So uh, I would like to thank again uh, all the presenters for participating to this webinar. Um, as said, uh, the presentation will be sent to you, to all participants, um, and a recording of this webinar will be available online, so we'll be able to access to it again. Um, let, let me simply close uh, the webinar by uh, saying that indeed that's a topic that uh, AIE and Solar Power Europe uh, is exploring a lot, and uh, Solar Power Europe is also working on uh, developing rooftop solar. Well, we're just launching a, a campaign to to encourage uh, the installation of rooftop solar on all buildings. And we would be launches the, launching this campaign on the 20th of June. So I invite you all to uh, to join us in this uh, campaign launch, which will be which will uh, take place in, in Brussels. Um, so thank you again for uh, attending and uh, speaking to this webinar. And uh, we hope to see you soon in the next uh, episode of this webinar series.